Good morning. I hope that uh, that song is a great testimony that hopefully we're seeking the Lord that He is enough. Um, he is enough for us. God has been so good to us. My name is Shane. I'm the youth pastor here at Rancho Baptist Church. Um, love the church family here. Thank you so much uh, just for, I don't know, I just thank the Lord so much for this awesome church family that we have. I thank the Lord for who He is and how good He's been to us. Amen? Amen. And how faithful He's been to us as a church. Um, what a blessing to know God and be known by Him. Hopefully you're reminded of that and encouraged by that this morning. Um, before we get into our sermon this morning, um, let me pray for us. Pray that God would prepare our hearts to hear His Word. Um, that He would just speak to our hearts this morning and we would be changed by Him. Let's pray. Father, we come to You this morning. Father, where else will we go? You have the words of life, Lord. We come to gather around Your Word this morning. Would You teach us, train us, Lord, rebuke and admonish and, oh, Lord, train us in righteousness, Lord. Your word is powerful. I pray that it would speak to our hearts this morning and change us, Lord, that we'd walk away from here changed, Lord, that you'd be glorified, high and lifted up this morning. Father, all praise and glory and honor to you. You are way more than enough, Lord. May we continue to be thankful. May we continue to glorify your name this morning. In Christ's name, amen. amen. The title of this, the sermon this morning is True Repentance. And uh, we want to look at what true repentance is in light of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And we'll be looking to the Apostle Paul's words to the church in Corinth and 2 Corinthians. Don't turn there yet. Um, we just got to get right into it this morning. But near the close of Paul's missionary career, the Apostle summed up his preaching around two points that we see in Acts 20.21. It says, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of two things, of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And these two, repentance and faith, go together in thought and result since they are in fact inseparable. Faith and repentance. Where there is no true repentance and attitude and action toward God, faith is inoperative. And the tendency in our easy believism uh, culture that we live in today um, is to say a great deal about faith and not nearly enough about repentance. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, just so we're clear this morning as we get going. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. We want to make it clear this morning that we are saved by grace alone and God does this saving faith in us. We want to make that very clear through Scripture, but there is also repentance as we look at true repentance this morning. Ephesians 2, look at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Verse 10, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I just want to make that very clear this morning uh, as we talk about what true repentance is, that we are saved through faith, saved by grace alone, and God does this work in us. Hopefully God has done that work in you this morning, saved you. 
And there's this daily dependence upon God in the life of every believer. We need to be, and we'll talk about this more next week, we'll be, we need to be preaching the gospel to ourselves daily. Um, in this easy believism culture, we feel like, hey, because I just said a prayer when I was six, because I went to a crusade when I was such and such an age, because I said a prayer that now I'm saved. God uses those things, but are you continually trusting Christ daily for salvation? Are you turning to Him daily? Is He making that change in you through the power of His Holy Spirit? And God desires to bring about repentance so that we might be cleansed and not lose the blessings of our salvation. God is continuing to cleanse us. And this repentance may not be instantaneous, but may take time spent in sorrow. And we'll see this this morning. Godly sorrow brings about repentance that brings new faith and new deeds and new zeal for the Lord. We should see a change in our lives and others as God does His transforming work in us to make us more like Christ. That is God's work in us, His transforming work. No doubt through these past seven weeks, you have felt sorrow. I know I have. No doubt we're still, he we're still healing. I know that I've asked God to examine my heart and try my thoughts and find every evil and wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. The question I ask is, is my sorrow godly sorrow that causes repentance that leads to salvation? or a worldly sorrow that leads to death. And we'll unpackage what the difference is between godly and worldly sorrow and what true repentance is this morning. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to go through verses 8 through 10 this morning as we look at what true repentance is. Next week we're going to look at the fruit of what true repentance is. Through verses 11 through 13. Look at verse 8. We'll read verses 8 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief or godly sorrow so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Look at verse 8 again. Verse 8 references the strong words spoken in love concerning a particular sin in the church in Corinth. It says this, For though I cause you sorrow by my letter, Paul says, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see or I perceive that my letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. And my letter could refer to 1 Corinthians, but more likely to a lost th third letter that Paul had written to the Corinthians. Paul's harsh letter had hurt them, and it had hurt Paul too. He had not relished his role as disciplinarian and in fact at one point wished he had not sent it with Titus. Had not sent that letter with Titus. But genuine love cannot remain silent where it sees those loved in danger and therefore in need of warning. And yet genuine love also cannot but feel regrets at the necessity for causing sorrow, even though that sorrow is temporary and directed for a beneficial end. Paul is like a father who finds regret, not pleasure, in seeing his son temporarily suffer pain under the surgeon's knife, but grateful for the cure that the operation will produce. He has that fatherly love. Or like a father who is grieved when he finds it necessary to punish his son severely, but nonetheless goes through with the action because it is directed towards his son's benefit, welfare, and good. That's the heart that Paul has here. And this reminds me of God's word in Hebrews 12, 3 through 6. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, 
so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Let that sink in for a little bit. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. God disciplines those he loves. My prayer during this time is that God would bring us low and humble as a church, as his church, so that he will bring his change in us as we move forward. Have you guys seen a change in your own personal life that God has been doing through what God's been bringing us through as a church? Have you, personally? I pray that we would not be so quick to get up and get back to quote-unquote normal. I don't even know what normal is. But I don't want to get up too quickly. I want to say, Lord, run your full course. Humble us. Crush our pride. Do your work. I want to see all that the Lord has for us. And I pray that the Lord would bring us about, bring about in us a deep repentance so that He might cleanse us and bring about the change that leads to this joy and zeal of the Lord that godly sorrow desires to produce. This joy. I pray that the Lord will continue to transform us as we grow to love Him more, and He may have to do that through sorrow we experience as a church. We're not done with it. We're not done. God is continuing to sift up sin, bring about sin that needs to be taken care of. May God bring about in us a godly sorrow so that we are repenting and that is bringing us the joy of our salvation that's only found in Him. How has God been growing you during this time? Think about that. How has He been challenging you and breaking you for His glory? There's this cool song that I've been enjoying a lot by Shane and Shane. And I don't like them just because of the name, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, but it's called a song that you might want to look up, Though You Slay Me. God is in the process of breaking, breaking His children for His glory. And He will put us through a breaking process, a refiner's fire process for His glory that we may grow more and honor His name. May we consider who we are coming to worship and why we are coming to this place every Sunday, right? Back to the text. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 highlights that it is God's will that we become sorrowful to the point of repentance. He says this, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. Now that Titus had, had returned and brought him the good news from Corinth, as we see in 2 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, Paul says this, When I came to Trous to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave for them and went on to Macedonia. Look at chapter 7, verse 5. Here. We'll shed some more light on the context here. For even when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. As he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. Paul's regretting the letter is now turned to what? Rejoicing. Why? Because the Corinthians had turned from their godly, this godly sorrow produced repentance that now led to salvation. He was rejoicing in the work that God had been doing. He didn't rejoice in their sorrow, but in their correcting the wrong. They took the letter to heart that Paul wrote them and became sorrowful for their sin, and this deep sorrow led to repentance. And I want to take a deeper look at what repentance is this morning. We hear that word thrown around. It's Christianese for us sometimes, right? And repentance, this Greek word metanoia, means a change of mind that leads to a change of action. 
There is no way to continuously remain in full fellowship with the Lord Jesus without repentance. Hopefully we're repenting daily with the struggle against sin. And this is a change only God can do in us. And repentance is defined in the Shorter Catechism. This is just a neat uh, just reference here. Repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin, an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Repentance consists essentially in a change of heart and mind and will. Apart from regeneration, our thoughts of God, of ourselves, of sin, and of righteousness is radically perverted apart from regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Regeneration changes our hearts and our minds. It radically renews them. Hopefully you've been renewed. Old things have passed away and what? All things have become new. All things have become new. Repentance we must, we must not think of as consisting merely in a change of mind in general. It is very particular and concrete. The test of repentance is the genuineness and resoluteness of our repentance in respect to our own sins. Our own sins. Repentance in the case of the Thessalonians, in another one of Paul's letters to the church, manifested itself in the fact that they turned from idols to serve the living God. And it was their idolatry which evidenced their alienation from God, and it was repentance regarding that that proved the genuineness of their faith and of their hope. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9-10, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. But you see it there. They turn to God from idols. There was this turning away and turning to. In Luke 24, 46-47, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Then in Acts 2, 37-38, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The new life in Christ Jesus means that the chains which bind us to the dominion of sin are what? Are broken. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that such good news? Yes. That if you're a true believer in Christ Jesus, the chains have been broken. The believer is dead to sin by the body of Christ. The old man has been crucified that the body of sin might be destroyed. And God is doing that work daily. And that is why we do not serve sin. That is amazing. Repentance is that which describes the response of turning from sin to God. Just as the specific character of faith is to receive and rest upon Christ alone for salvation. Matthew 3, 8. Jesus says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Luke 5, 32. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Acts 5, 31. God exalted Him, Jesus, at His right hand as a leader and Savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. As we grow in Christ, the Holy Spirit continually shows us areas where we are not right with God. Is that true of you? If that, if you're, if you, if that is foreign to you this morning, we'll talk about this later, but you may want to examine yourself to see whether you are truly of the faith. 
As we grow in Christ, the true believer, the Holy Spirit continually shows us areas where we are not right with God. To cleanse the godly guilt of the Holy Spirit's conviction, we must repent and change our attitude in this area and accept God's standard. If not, our heart hardens to the Spirit's conviction. And it becomes more and more difficult to repent until we become just legalistic Christians going our own way with our own opinions, justifying ourselves with our own set of rules. We don't want to be there. I pray that God has been doing His work in us corporately as a church during this time, but also individually. That we've been saying, Lord, examine me. Here's my heart, my thoughts. Where have my thoughts been? Where's my heart been? Through this time, I know God's been, been doing a, a, a work in, in my, my own life and my own marriage, making me more needy for the Lord, making me more dependent upon Him. Uh, Katie and I are connecting in deeper ways, praying more together, and not just doing it just because it, I guess that's what we have to do, you know, <laughs> but actually praying together out of a desperate need for the Lord and making sure we ask other the hard questions and also that we're guarding our hearts and minds when it comes to our companionship and our relationship. God's doing that work. What has He been doing in your heart, in your mind? Now this morning, am I saying that mature Christians need to repent? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Jesus said that we do. Luke 17, 3-4. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Paul. Paul agreed with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 12, 21. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you. And I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, the sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. And then four of the seven churches of Asia Minor listed in Revelation 2 and 3 were commanded to repent. Disobedient Christians need to repent. Not in order to be saved, but in order to restore their close relationship and fellowship with God. That's crucial for us. We can't keep on going with unrepentant sin in our lives. We must come and humble ourselves before the Lord and confess our sin to Him. Let me ask you a question. Are we, are you, desperate to get right with the Lord quickly when we sin? Or as the Holy Spirit brings up things in our hearts, are we saying, Lord, I need to get right with You. I need to deal. I need to handle my sin before You. I need to deal with this. May God do this work in us. And Paul gives, the, gives us the result of repentance in the purpose clause, so that, or in order that. Repentance under God's conviction is the way to God. Repentance under God's conviction is the way to God. It is the only way whereby we will not suffer loss. Look at verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 describes two ways of reaction to pain and sorrow. It says this, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation or deliverance. But the sorrow of the world produces death. When we reacted to conviction with godly sorrow, it says, Greek again, katatheon, it leads to repentance which produces or brings salvation. God always does the work of salvation. He always does. What a gift and what a Savior we have in Jesus Christ. And the phrase godly sorrow here is literally grieved according to God. Or the NASB's version says made sorrowful according to the will of God. Or the NIV's became sorrowful as God intended. It's a sorrow that comes from God. It's the weight of our sin upon us. And God brings about repentance and that salvation, that change of heart. 
But weren't the Corinthians already believers? Weren't they already saved? Absolutely. Then what does this mean? This, this Greek word translated salvation, soteria, means more than simply being born again. God intends to save us from the power of our sin, which He does through deep repentance. That daily salvation. That daily reminder of the Gospel. And there are two kinds of sorrow that Paul shares here in the text. Godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. The sorrow that God brings is life-changing. Do you see a change in your, happening in your life? It's, it's outworking brings repentance that leads to salvation. Godly sorrow causes the Christian to look at his sin and see its blackness and just disgusting nature of their sin. And then they see God's displeasure, which brings about a change of mind and also a change of behavior. This is the sorrow God works into our lives. Repentance over sin is the resolute turning away from sin, which leads to reconciliation and then leads to life. What does godly sorrow look like quickly here? Godly sorrow, it, it is focused on God and other persons. The well-being of others is its first priority. It's always focused on God, godly sorrow. Philippians 2, 3-4, and it's also focused on others. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. That's huge. So godly sorrow, it's focused on God and, and other persons. The well-being of others is its first priority. It hates the sin itself. It hates the sin. It accepts the consequences of sin as well. It fully accepts responsibility. Godly sorrow. Yep, I fully accept responsibility. Pinwheel. It seeks out accountability. Godly sorrow seeks out accountability. I want to change. God's doing this work in me. It's this godly sorrow, repentance, salvation, this daily. I want, to, I want to change. I want to grow in my walk with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We need accountability in the Christian life. We can't live life alone. That's why God's given us the beautiful picture of his church where Christ is the head. We're the body, many members. And then lastly, godly sorrow, it is patient. It allows a lot of time. It allows a lot of time. And the contrast to this godly sorrow is worldly sorrow. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Sorrow which is characteristic of the world is grief over the consequences of sin brought rather than the sin itself. It's worried about the consequences. What's going to happen now? Thus it leaves the person's heart unchanged, producing death. What does worldly sorrow look like? It is self-focused. It's self-protective. You remember when Cain killed his brother Abel. Genesis 4.13, Cain remarks to God in Genesis 4.13, My punishment is greater than I can bear. He was so focused on just self-protection on saying, hey, the consequences of his sin, he never came with a true repentant heart to the Lord. It is self-focused. It's self-protective. It's also, it doesn't primarily hate the sin. It hates the consequences of sin. We need to hate the sin. There are going to be consequences for our sin. But ultimately, Lord, may you lead us to this godly sorrow that produces repentance that leads to salvation. It attempts to blame shift in our pride. We tend to blame shift. Remember in the garden, Adam, Eve, it's the woman you gave me, you know, Eve. It's a serpent, you know, it's like blame shifting in our pride. Worldly sorrow tends to blame shift. Well, I did this because they did this. No, you did that because of your own sin. It resents accountability and actually mocks it. Oh, you think, oh, you need accountability? 
It resents accountability and actually mocks it. Oh, you're weak, huh? You need all those. Yeah, I'm weak. Yeah, I need accountability. Yeah, I need brothers around me, godly men who are going to encourage me in my faith and ask me the hard questions. Yeah, I need it. Worldly sorrow just goes, ah, uh, yeah, ha, that's good for you. It is impatient. It demands to be trusted and restored immediately. Worldly sorrow. It brings about the worst in people. Worldly sorrow brings about the worst in people. It is not sorrow because of the disgustingness of sin as rebellion against God, but sorrow because of the painful and unwelcome consequences of sin. It is self-pity rather than a contrite turning to God for mercy and grace. Even King David realized this. Psalm 51. Some of our homework this week, reading Psalm 51 thoroughly this week as believers. To look at the response of a true repentant heart, King David, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Here's the, here's the true repentance. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. This is the heart of true repentance. Cain was sorrowful over what his sin cost him, not for killing his brother. Esau was bitter and intensely sorrowful with many tears over the loss of his birthright, but that did not bring about repentance. Hebrews 12 that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no ch chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. And then again, King David too, Psalm 51, suffered extreme sorrow because of his sin, but his sorrow was directed to God in deep repentance. He, had, he acknowledged his guilt and sin, before the Lord, and he cried out to God for forgiveness. Psalm 51, 12 to 14. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Godly sorrow produces praise. Godly sorrow produces this ultimate end of just worshiping the Lord because of how good His forgiveness is. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Deliver me from my sin. That will be even another form of, um, well, that's what godly sorrow produces, will be praise and worship to our great God. And perhaps the difference is best seen in Judas and Peter. Judas repented himself, was full of regret, and went and committed what? Suicide. And while Peter wept and repented of his fall and awaited his Lord's restoration. You can see that in Matthew 26. Near the end of Matthew 26 and the beginning of Matthew 27. There are plenty of people who are sorry enough when sin has worked its core, and its bitter fruits have been produced. The person lying in the hospital who are, just, who are just broken up and wrecked with the sin of their youth, and they are just crushed and depressed. It's just that worldly sorrow. Or the fraudulent deceiver who got debt-free, but lost his reputation and cannot regain anyone's trust. People are often sorry for their conduct without thinking of it as sin against God. Do we realize our sin before a holy God and go, that's disgusting, Lord. We have all seen this worldly sorrow in people. They're, they are sorry, 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 sorry for what they did, but there is truly no heart change and a change in action. There is no genuine desire to get right with God and in turn please Him with their lives. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, where the Apostle Paul says, man, I make it my aim, Lord, to please you. Because of what you've done for me in, in faith and repentance, I, I just want to make it my aim now to please you. So Lord, keep my sin list short. 
And sin is more than just a wrong, a broken law, a failure, a transgression. It is an affront to a holy and righteous God. We must take our sin seriously against our perfect and just God. And the true means of evoking true repentance is the contemplation of the cross. The cross. The great power of Christ's love and sacrifice should melt the heart into true repentance as you wonder how a righteous God has not already thrown you into hell. So you look at the cross, you see God's amazing grace and love, and you go, Lord, I know what I should have gotten, (laughs) but because of your mercy and your grace, your kindness, you've led me to repentance. Or do you not, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Romans 10, 12 and 13. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing His riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Exodus 34, 6 to 7, showing the heart of our great God. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. We desperately need Jesus Christ because of our sins committed against a holy and righteous God. And what is the connection between repentance and salvation? You cannot get salvation without repentance. You do not get salvation by repentance. It is no use to preach faith, faith, faith unless you also preach it with break off your iniquities. You you see that with Jesus. Go and sin no more in the Gospels, don't you? I mean, he knows that we're going to sin. We struggle with the sin nature. But that's where grace, we're continuing to come and repent to him daily. Trusting in the Gospel. Trusting in what he's done for us. We see even in our text this morning that Paul had this fear. Why did Paul fear? He feared that his work might have been in vain and that some of the professing believers in Corinth would be hardened by the deceitfulness of their sin and follow the way that leads to death, not salvation. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, 2-3, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin bride to Christ, Isn't that a rad picture right there? But I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. At the end of the book, in chapter 13, verse 5 of 2 Corinthians, he says this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? unless, indeed, you fail to meet the test. What is the test? What is the evidence that their faith is genuine? The answer of chapter 7, verse 10, would be there is a path that leads to salvation and one that leads to death. The way to test your faith is to test which path you are on. Which path are you on this morning? The path that leads to salvation is not the path of sinless perfection. It is the path of godly sorrow and genuine repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation. Are we grieved by our own sin with a godly sorrow and do we turn from it? That is the test of our faith and the evidence that Christ is in us. For Christians, repentance is an attitude of life. You hear that? Repentance for the believer is an attitude of life. Are you quick? To see your sin for what it is and how it offends a holy God. And are you quick to repent and turn from that? Daily we ask God's Spirit to show us our sin and trust God's power at work in our lives to humbly come before Him and confess and turn from our sin. I remember times where I have experienced a godly sorrow because of my frustration in disciplining my kids out of anger. 
and all of a sudden I'm disciplining my kids out of anger, frustration. God brought about his conviction through the Holy Spirit living in me. I confessed my sin, turned from it, and even went to confess to, you name it, whatever child you want to choose, Micah, Abby, or Caleb, they've all been confessed to. Daddy was wrong. In his frustration, he disciplined you out of anger. I came before the Lord and asked him for forgiveness already. Will you please forgive me? That godly sorrow that just so badly wants to get right with the Lord. We are going to sin, but do you long to get right with the Lord? There's that godly sorrow that causes repentance, that leads to salvation. I have, I have experienced godly sorrow when I've shut down my wife in our conversations at home. And I've spoken harshly with her. And the Holy Spirit brings about conviction. And I knew I was grieving the Holy Spirit. So I needed to humble myself before the Lord and see my sin against Him and my wife and ask for what? Forgiveness. And I knew I couldn't go on until I got right with the Lord and I got right with my wife. You can't go on living a lie. If there's some sin that needs to be dealt with. May the ingredient of godly sorrow never be missing from our lives. When was the last time you were sorry for words you'd spoken, something you'd done, or a wrong attitude you harbored? When's the last time? Did you repent? Or do you need to do some confessing right now before the Lord? To repent is to be sorry for sin that you are already, that you are ready to give it up. May God cause us to keep our sin list short. And some homework this week, you might want to write that down in your notes. I would encourage you to read Psalm 51 and then Psalm 32 this week. Okay? God is working. Let's go before Him. Father, how good You are to your children, Lord. How good you are to your church. Lord, you, you want us to have pure devotion to you. Thank you so much that's your kindness that leads us to repentance, Lord. I pray that we, more often than not, Father, would be experiencing a godly sorrow that causes true repentance which leads to salvation. And even for us as believers, a continual joy of our salvation that's found only in Christ alone. Lord, I pray that you would do that, that work in us this morning, Lord. I pray that you would encourage us. Father, that this week you would search our hearts and know every evil, wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting, Lord. I pray that we would be reminded of just King David's heart in Psalm 51, that repentant heart, Lord. We know that a contrite and broken spirit, Lord, you will never deny. May we become broken and contrite before you. Our sin is ever before us, Lord. We know it. And against you and you only have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight, Lord. May you bring about a true repentance in us, Lord, cleanse your church. Cleanse us as the bride of Christ, Lord. Thank you so much for this time this morning, Lord. We pray that you, your Holy Spirit, Lord, would do a work in our hearts to make us more like your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, do that for your own glory and for your own praise, Lord. We pray this in the Awesome name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and leader. Amen.